Yeah, I'll go live on YouTube now. Okay, hi everyone. Thanks for coming to this week's seminar. Apologies for the delay in getting started. Just a quick overview before we begin. Uh, the, the seminar will be for around 40 to 50 minutes in length, so please keep your mics muted during this talk. And it is being live streamed to YouTube and recorded, just so you're aware. There will be time for, for questions at the end. If you're watching on Zoom, please uh, raise your hand or put your question in the chat if you prefer. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can type your question in the chat and we will ask it on your behalf at the end. So I'll now hand over to Richard, who is going to introduce our speaker for today. Thank you. Hi, I'm just going to share a share a screen with you quickly. You cannot start it when, when others are sharing. Can I start again now? Yeah, there we go. So uh, just because it's Max, I couldn't resist this. So this is Max, um, but in 2000, I think. Um, Something like that. Yes. So this is Max when he Max's pedigree at Liverpool predates mine, which is getting to the point of being slightly scary. So this was Max when he came as an undergraduate. And just to show you that he actually did some stuff. Oh, God. <laughs> so here we have our itinerary field course. And here is Max in all his glory. And listen to the, those of you who've got geophysics, you can listen to the quality of that contact. That was very good seismics. Anyway, I won't do any more of that. Um, but, so let me unshare the screen. Okay, I have unshared, good. Um, so Max was a undergraduate and then postgrad at Liverpool. Um, before he went on to, let me get this, let's see if I can get the right order, Minnesota, then Potsdam, GF said Potsdam, then Iceland, then Minnesota again. So there's a kind of certain, um, uh, uh, kind of reproducibility there, um, but, Max is now a research associate professor, which I would anticipate to mean that in addition to running the technical stuff, he actually gets to do some interesting stuff. And I suspect that's some of the stuff we're going to hear about. So uh, I'm looking forward to this, Max. Off you go. Thank you. Yes, I, yeah, I do a little bit of research. 10% uh, of my time I can do some research with. So I'm going to tell everyone a little bit about that today. So can I share my screen now, Caitlin? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. 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 Let's get to the beginning. So I'm going to talk about the work I was doing in Iceland. And this is actually a long term project. And many, many people have been involved in this. Um, so I'm really presenting on behalf of all these people you see here on the screen. So um, my main collaborators on this work are Yuji Yamamoto at the Kochi Core Center in Japan, Hiroyuki Hoshi at the Aichi um, University. But the work was started a very long time ago in 1994 by Masaru Kono and Hidafumi Tanaka. Uh, need to get rid of this thing on the side. So this is a view down from one of the sections um, from the top of a ridge called Lunderhals in the valley of Lunderekidala. And I'm gonna be talking about this valley throughout this presentation. And you can see that there are many flows here, about 32 flows here. Um, I'm gonna start with acknowledging uh, the funding agencies and other people here, first projects re receive funding from many different sources in, in Iceland and also in Japan. And we currently have a five year grant working on Iceland. I'd also like to thank Leo Christensen, um, who sadly passed away in 2020, but his help with everything to do with Iceland was invaluable during my time. Uh, and many others have contributed to field and laboratory work, understanding the geology of the area. And um, Richard Bono uh, also helped with some of the analysis at the end of this presentation. So what are the aims of this study? We want to obtain new information about directional changes in Earth's magnetic field over millions of years. We want to combine Radio, radio isotopic dating. So this is potassium argon and argon dating with paleomagnetism to constrain the age of the lavas. 
And then we want to see, well, what can this tell us about the long-term evolution of Earth's magnetic field? Our work with the geological logs and the magnetic field can, might be able to help us understand where there are large hiatuses in lava production and might, how this might be related to the geological, the volcanic and the glacial history of Iceland. But I'm not going to touch on that in this talk. So a little bit of background before we get into the results. So this is just a, a schematic of the geomagnetic field. It's dominantly dipolar and its uh, axis um, changes through time, currently around about 10 degrees offset from the tilt axis of Earth. Um, and over long periods of time, we expect the field to tend to what we call the geocentric axial dipole. Uh, and this is when the position of the geomagnetic North Pole is averaged, it co coincides with Earth's geographic North Pole. So the, these are, through time, this may move around, and but on average, it, it coincides um, with, with the uh, tilt axis. Um, and at Earth's surface, we can measure some different quantities. We have uh, geographic north here, geographic east here, uh, and Earth's magnetic field is treated as a vector. So we can measure what we call the declination on the horizontal plane and the inclination in the vertical plane. And I'm going to be mentioning declination and inclination throughout this talk. Uh, I'll also be talking a lot about virtual geomagnetic poles. Uh, and this is where we can take the declination and inclination and uh, site latitude and longitude of where we're recording, assume a dipole configuration and work out where the past geomagnetic pole uh, was. So here we have an idealized paleomagnetic sequence. So it's just a, a schematic of a bunch of lavas and we've obtained uh, inclination and declination for each of these lavas. I've made um, a, a reversal through here and then I've converted the inclination and declination to the latitude of the VGP. And here, this combination of directions and a location, I think I set it at Iceland, uh, would give a normal polarity here. If it, the VGP latitude is positive, call it a normal polarity. Then we have some transitional directions, and this is a reversal. And then we go into having negative VGP latitudes, and this is reverse polarity. And then I just switched it at the end here back to a normal polarity. So this is what we would call a, a reversal and or a reversal boundary here. And I, we can plot that uh, on a globe of the Earth. <clears throat> so these are the poles that were at the top, then they, then they swing around and then they come back again. So how do we do the field work? Everything starts with the field work. So uh, we first need to find good sections to sample. And this is a section in England's house, which is one of the sections I'll be talking about. We need to have a good stack of lava flows. They need to be accessible. We need to have running water because we need water to control, con, uh, to cool the drill bits. Uh, and we need to find some uncomplicated geology. Um, and even in Iceland, where you think it might be just a whole bunch of lava sitting on top of one another, uh, it, it's actually much more complicated than that. So we need to make detailed geological logs. We need to log the stratigraphy, uh, locations of faults, locations of dike, strike and dip measurements. Um, and you can see here, this is a section on Lunderhals that we have many different types of uh, rocks here. We have ignimbrites, different kinds of lavas. We have lahars. We have other uh, glacial volcanic deposits such as hyaloclastites. So we have to be aware of these uh, when making our study because these can constrain the time of events or things that may have affected uh, the lavas when they were erupted. So this is me 
sampling in Iceland a few years ago, um, and we take around five to seven cores per lava flow and some blocks for dating. Uh, you can see very nicely here that we have a, a, a big stack of lavas here. So Iceland's really an exceptional place to do studies like this. Um, you may think I'm, I'm sampling in Spain. This is probably the nicest uh, weather I, I've ever had on sampling. Uh, it usually more looks like this. I think I was wearing seven layers uh, during this uh, when I was doing this sampling here. Um, and once we've drilled the cores, we need to orient them. Um, we use this, the sun, which can be very problematic in Iceland uh, because it really isn't sunny that often. We can, ref we can use magnetic north and we can use reference sighting. So typically we try and do all three if possible. And then when we get back, we prepare the samples and we measure them on a magnetometer. This is the magnetometer at Iceland, but the work done here was made in Iceland and in Kochi. Uh, and this is an example of what a specimen looks like inside um, the magnetometer. Um, for all of this work, we've used alternating field demagnetization, whereby we can apply, apply increasingly large alternating fields to remove um, more and more of the magnetization, and we can work out the magnetization history of the sample. So this is an iterative process. We demagnetize, measure, demagnetize, measure. Uh, and this is an example of the kind of data we can get out. This is a very, very idealized example. This kind of plot is an orthogonal vector plot. So we're showing um, two planes at once here. So this is in a geographic coordinate system. So we have west and up on this axis, and then we have north and north, south and south. So we can start with what we call the natural remnant magnetization. So no demagnetization was done. Then we can start to apply increasing fields. We remove some of the magnetization, higher fields, more, more, more. And hopefully we get something that looks like this. And then we can uh, make a fit. We generally use principal component analysis to, de de to determine what we call the characteristic remnant magnetization direction or a CHRM. And in this case, for this example I made up, it would have a declination of around 300, an inclination of 64 and what we call a maximum angular deviation of less than a degree. And we would be incredibly happy if we got results like this from our rocks. Okay, and then we have individual results from the specimens and we like to, we want to combine them for the whole of the lava. And we use something called Fisher statistics here, uh, which I'm not going to go into great detail, it's a, a, a way of calculating essentially a mean direction from the flow. Um, and we can also estimate the position of the direction and the angular dispersion of the direction. And these are parameters I'm going to refer to um, a bit later on in the talk. Okay, so I'm getting to the results of the project now, but I'm gonna start with a little bit of background on the project. So this uh, big long, uh, word is the is Lunda Reiki Dalar, um, and this is the name of the valley. So Dalar is like Dale in English, um, and Lundar is uh, the name of the place. So Lunda Reiki Dalar is the area that we're studying, and this project was initially conceived by Masaru Kono in the early 1990s. He had uh, aimed to visit Iceland uh, at the end of his career and to sample numerous locations to gain some understanding about long-term field variations. So he measured other, or he sampled other places in Iceland, not just uh, this valley. And he came with a team in 1994. This included Hirofumi Tanaka and Takahiro Koyaguchi. Um, the results of all the work were never published except some of the dates and um, some nods to the paleomagnetism, which were in the MSc thesis of Kitagawa, and that was 
presented in 1998. So these are the sites around Iceland that uh, Kono and his team sampled. And we're going to be looking at this one, Lundarhals, which is the ridge above uh, Lundarekidara to the north. So these are the, this is the team in 1994. We have Kono, Tanaka, Koyaguchi, and then this is Leo Christensen uh, when he was visiting in Iceland uh, there. And this is the new sampling team. So many new people have attended. We have, uh, there's me, um, Yamamoto-san, Hoshi-san, uh, some undergraduate students, uh, a master student of mine a few years ago, and then my current two master students with a, a colleague, Evan Finnis, too. So this is uh, the geology of Iceland. Uh, the dark, well, the pinkish rocks here are the youngest rocks on Iceland. Uh, we have the rift coming through here. We have other vol active volcanic regions here that are passing through Iceland. And you can see that we have the ages and they're getting older away from the rift. So when we're in the West Fjords, we have some of the oldest rocks of Iceland are up here and some very old rocks over here on the eastern part. And we're going to be looking in this region. So this is Borgafjorda here, and we're sampling in this region here. All of the triangles here, these are all the paleomagnetic sampling locations in Iceland, Iceland today. Uh, the white areas, these are the glaciers. So this is a zoom in um, of the area. This is Borgafjörður here, and we're looking at uh, Lundrahals. This is Lundrahekedalur here. This is a very large lake, Stoladalsvatn. Um, I'm going to just zoom into the area that we're looking at here. Oh, but I did want to point out some other things. You can see that there's another ridge here a ridge here, a ridge here, a ridge here, and a ridge here. Here's a large central volcano. And I think you can see that there's some uh, lineation around in this area. So this is on the edge of the current rift zone, which trends in this direction. Uh, and the lavas were erupted to the east and then uh, and to the west. And that's what makes up this pile of lavas here. So here we have the area again, but I've, I've uh, noted where all the sampling, where all the sections we sampled are. So this is the oldest part of the ridge. It's furthest away from the rift and the lavas dip towards the rift. So the VM, VST, VST, and VT, they're the oldest rocks of the ridge, and EA and EB are the youngest rocks of the ridge. So, so this is Lundarekidana again. Here's the Lundahals ridge and the Englandshals ridge. And these are the two ridges I'm going to be referring to throughout this talk. In total, we sampled 18 sections, uh, sampling over 19 kilometers. Over 2,400 cores were taken. Uh, potassium argon dating samples were taken from 18 flows, and we've taken new samples for argon argon dating from 10 flows. Uh, the green here are the 1994 sampling sections, the red 2016, blue 2018, um, orange 2019, and then uh, these sections in yellow are the most recent sections that we sampled. Okay, so here's a picture of Lunderhals, and this is the old, these are the oldest lavas of the ridge. So that, I was taking the picture from on the road here, looking back to VM here. So VM is Varma like um, And in this section here, I think we have about 35 lavas um, that were sampled. Uh, here's a little, bit closer to some of the sections. These are both from the VG section. Uh, so I, in the very first slide, I was standing at the top and I took a photo down, but this is at the bottom looking up. 
and you can see it's a very large pile of lavas and it has nice running water through it. This is a bit closer, uh, me sort of for scale. So the lavas don't really get much thicker than um, what I'm showing here. Some of them are thinner as well. So we have to uh, consider the geology. Um, so this is the VG section I just showed. Here's the VH section, which is a bit younger. And we can see that the lava beds are dipping like this. Um, so this is a trace of a lava bed coming through here. So the top of VG is roughly the bottom of VH here. And this is over about one kilometer distance. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a variety of rock types. We see prominent red beds, glacial deposits, and there's numerous dikes as well that cross cut this area. Uh, the tilt is also somewhat variable. So we have to be, we have to consider this when we're doing uh, tilt corrections of our directions. And across this area, there's also numerous faulting uh, 27, and this does complicate things somewhat. So back in the 1970s, there were some BSc students in Iceland, Omar Bjarkis Marsen and Sigmund Reinesen. They um, mapped the rocks under the guidance of Christian Simonsen. So we have a good idea about the different kind of rock types here, plus the logs that um, Koyabuchi made. And I've compiled them here. Um, these are the varying rock types that we have. And you can see there's a number of faults and they do shift the blocks up and down say between VG, VH, VJ. So we have to be very careful when correlating um, the different sections that we sampled. On the whole, the strike and dip of the lavas are around 40 degrees uh, with a tilt between seven, and, but sometimes higher, maybe uh, up to 15 degrees in some, some cases. Okay. I'm going to show the paleomagnetic results now. And these are just three examples demonstrating the, uh, the overall quality of the data that we can get from these rocks. So earlier on, I gave an example of one of the, what we would see as an ideal case. Um, and actually that was a resample of this, uh, this result here. So we, we see that the maximum angular deformation is very low, which is what we're looking for. So this is a very well-constrained direction. Uh, this is during one of the, from a transitional lava. And we, again, we can see that we're constraining this direction well. And it, it can be often very hard to get good quality directional results from transitional lavas. This is a slightly higher MAD, but perfectly acceptable. And here's another transitional lava as well, also producing a, a very uh, good result. Um, and from the Lunderhaus section, we obtained directions from 1,577 specimens from 254 lava flows. And we can look at the, the data per site. So these are the mean directions. Um, this is the alpha 95 that I mentioned, generally the five, below five degrees angular dispersion is good. Um, some of the flows are higher than this, um, but they still produce precision parameters that are acceptable. The high, higher number for precision parameter is better. Um, and we used a cutoff of five, uh, 50, sorry, so anything anything above 50 was accepted. You can still see there's a reasonable number of lavas that did have kappa less than 50, but not on the whole, um, the lava flows produced good mean directions. And I'm gonna talk about the VGPs again. This was just the example that I showed. So I'm gonna show all of the directional results as VGP latitudes um, as, there's the, as there's not too many plots of declination and inclination, it can get a bit confusing. So I've tried to simplify it by showing VGP latitudes. So here are the, the VGP latitudes of each of the lava flows for all of the Lunderhaus sections. 
I'm going to come on to the Anglin House section. So in a bit, we're just going to look at the Linda House to start with. So in this plot, all of the lava's directions were adjusted for their strike and dip, or dip and dip direction, and converted to a VGP. This is gives you an idea of how the uncertainty that I'm showing was calculated here. Yeah. So VM is the oldest section and VK is the youngest section. So we're, we're going, we're getting progressively older as we go left to right and left to right. And we can already see that we have numerous reversal boundaries here. So for example, in VM, we start off with reverse flows and then we switch to normal flows, we switch back. And this happens throughout the section here. So what we want to do with these individual sections is make a composite. And this helps us to see the, the stratigraphy much better, the magnetostratigraphy much clearer. So we made our correlation by looking at geological logs. We use the similarity of the paleomagnetic directions. Uh, for example, the overlapping of the alpha 95 cones of confidence. Um, and by doing this, we found that there are probably 10 flows uh, that are recording the same field direction. And this leaves us with 203 unique directions from, from our section. Um, in some cases, there could be there was no correlation between sections. So it's likely that we missed some flows between the different sections or that for some reason there was uh, no eruptions during that time. Um, and there's some aspects where the correlation is ambiguous. So we need to revisit those um, to see how reliable some of these correlations are. Okay, so before we try and interpret this series of normal and reverse polarities and reversals, we want to put some directions on these. So the initial dating was done in the 1990s at Okayama University and Tokyo University. And these are data that were shown in the master's thesis of Kitagawa. Um, so these are the 18 results but these are all from the younger flows. So these were result, uh, sorry, the older flows from VM through to VT. Um, however, alteration was a severe issue. And on the whole, it is very difficult to obtain potassium argon results from Icelandic rocks because the potassium content is so low. Um, Kitagawa also noticed that there was discolored ground mass and altered glass among the crystals and secondary mineral production. Um, so we have to be somewhat skeptical of these ages. Um, he had an alteration index. So I looked through these and, uh, and I removed ones that were two, three of the, were the, let's say the best quality of these, but we still have large uncertainties uh, between 100,000 and 500,000 years at uh, two sigma, at uh, two standard deviations. So after removing those altered results, we have nine, nine estimates of age. Uh, we've also done new dating, argon-argon dating, and this was done with Brian Jika at uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the Wiscar facility. And we've done these on eight Lunderhals lavas. And these were collected in, through 2016 and 2019. Uh, all samples contained low radiogenic argon and some discordance of the plateaus. However, age plateaus could be isolated for almost all of these samples. And we, we're gonna show the plateau ages here, but we can see that the uncertainties are still reasonably large. So on the top plot here is the plateau age with example of a lava, during a transition showing an age of 3.446 with an uncertainty of 50,000 years. The isochron age is more uncertain, similar age, but with 229,000 years of uh, uncertainty at two sigma. 
So if we look at all of the ages as a whole, the Lunderhaus Ridge, um, well, the Argon Argent dates ranges between about 3.09 million years to 4.05 million years. So this is the Lunderhaus composite again. Um, so previously I had colored each of the sections for the different individual sequences and now I've joined them together. And I've put the direction, uh, sorry, the age results onto the VGP latitude. So here's the, here are the oldest rocks uh, with the lowest composite flow number and the youngest rocks here. So it's a bit of a mess down here with the potassium argon ages. They're somewhat variable, but they're gonna be around about 4 million to maybe 4.3 million years old. The argon argon plateau ages in orange here, the oldest one we have is about 4 million years, which sort of fits in with the potassium argon ages here. Um, then we're showing we have a reversal boundary here with the date around uh, 3.4 ish million years. Another lava, which is just a few above showing around about, well, it's exactly the same as one of the estimates here. So this seems to be reasonably well constrained around 3.4 to 3.45 million years old for this reversal boundary. As we move up, we start to get slightly younger, 3.37, 3.6 million years. This one's a little bit lower than these other two, but we have another reversal boundary here about 3.3, 3.36. And then right at the top here, we have an age of about 3.1 million years old. So what we want to do next is compare this with the geomagnetic polarity time scale. Um, the first step is to let's break down, is to break down what we have into something a little bit more understandable. So here we have a boundary, we have a normal uh, subcron. Then we have this long period of reverse directions, perhaps with a couple of excursions in here. We have another reversal boundary, uh, maybe a post-reversal uh, transitional direction. We have a set of normal lava flows with perhaps another excursion. Then we have a reversal boundary and perhaps another subcron here. So I'm gonna compare this to the GPTS from 2012 of OG. And these ages fit reasonably well with those given in the GPTS. So if we start at the bottom here, we've got ages around four to 4.3. This is most likely going to, this normal subcron is most likely to be the Cochiti subcron here. Then we have a reverse period within the Gilbert cron, which lasts a long time. And this would seem to correlate here with this very large packet of reverse lavas. And this is around 4.05, which would correlate well with one of the lavas that we dated here in this packet. And then moving up, we have another reversal boundary here. We have it about 3.4. In the GPTS, it seems to be around 3.6. This might be due to uncertainties on our dating, um, or it might be that the, this boundary might need a revisiting for its age. Perhaps it's a little bit old in the GPTS. Um, so it, it's most likely that this is what we call the Gilbert Gauss boundary. So it's, in, it's the boundary between two major crons, the Gilbert and the Gauss. Then we had another block of normal lavas uh, which relates to the C2AN.3N. Um, and this relates well with these age. The boundaries are about 3.3. We have ages around 3.3 to 3.25. So this is most likely the transition into the mammoth, which is this set of reverse directions here. Above that, we have uh, more normal directions. And then we have this reverse period, the Kayana. And, uh, and this is... Uh, the upper part of the Gauss cron here. So it seems that our uh, Lunderhaus section correlates well with the uh, GPTS, though we have some slight differences between the ages. 
Okay, so I'm going to quickly go through now the Englund Tiles work, and this is the most recent work. So we're at the top of the ridge here uh, in a very blustery day with some ominous clouds hanging over us here. Um, so I'm not going to show the individual directions this time, I'm just going to skip to the VGP latitudes. On the left here, I'm showing the top of the Lunderhaus section, where we have the GB, GA, VK, where we have the mammoth subcron, the reverse mammoth subcron here. So the K, I should have shown a map here, but the K, A, T, A, E, A, E, B, they're on the other side of Lunderekidara, on the southern side. Um, so the reason I've split them up is that we're not exactly sure how the top of Lunderhaus and the bottom of our England's house section correlate. But we can see that KO has some, a set of interesting directions, some traditional directions. TA also has some trend, transitional directions. EA shows a large number of normal flows, as well as EB. And then at the top of EB, we have some transitional directions and some reverse lovers. So these sections record some very interesting uh, field behavior. So here I've tried to correlate them. This is just a draft composite. This work is, these directions were only recently finished just a couple of weeks ago here. We also have a couple of argon argon ages here. So I've uh, compiled them here. So this at the bottom is the Lunderhaus again. Then I think we have a break as we go from the north side of Lunderekedala to the southern side. Um, then we have the Ka section, which is showing this interesting transitional behavior going to normal clarity and then back down to reverse. This is likely the Kaena subcron. Then, then I'm pretty sure that we missed a bunch of lavas going from Ka to Ta. Then we pick up these uh, by a river section and we have transitional lavas. And then there's definitely an overlap between TA and EA um, from our logging uh, with some more transitional lavas here. Then we have this large section of EA and the top of EA overlaps with EB. Uh, and these lavas are around about 2.5 million years ago. Uh, then we have the boundary. So with these ages here, it would can mean that at the very top of EB here, we have the gauss matiama boundary. Um, and the Kayana subcron here. So then I'm going to just give the Lunderhaus section here on the left and the England House section here. So we have the Kochiti, which is over here. Then you know, we have this large, these large number of reverse levels, the Gilbert Gauss. We have the Mammoth. This is the correlation here the Mammoth, the Kayana and then the gauss matiama So we're, we're spanning between about 2.6 million years through to about 4.3 million years here. And this is probably the most detailed record of this period of time recorded um, by a volcanic section. Okay, uh, so why are these, why are the data useful? Well, it's as I just mentioned, the most detailed quasi-continuous record of the field be between this time. And maybe it can help us understand long-term variations in field behavior. Uh, how can we do this? Well, we can assess whether the field conforms to the geocentric axial dipole assumption. We can look at the distribution of VGPs and we can assess their directional variability through time with latitude. Uh, in this analysis, I'm just going to be showing the, the Lunderhaus sections here. Um, as the Englishow composite isn't fully complete, there may be some overlapping directions that we maybe need to synthesize. I'm just looking at the Lunderhaus here. So this is looking down on the North Pole. Um, the black dots are all the VGPs that have a normal polarity. Um, and here we're looking at the southern pole and the black dots are for reverse polarity. Here I flipped the reverse and normal, we have them all together. Um, you can, I hope you can see that we have 
I've plotted here two sets of colored circles, and these are the mean directions. And they're all very close to the geographic North Pole. Um, so it seems that when we consider the Lunder House directions, that they are consistent with the GAD hypothesis. But what about other direct directional data from Iceland? We have thousands of lava results from Iceland. Uh, Leo Christiansen and his colleagues measured a huge amount of data from all across of Iceland. I think for the total database between not and five million years, there are 4,470 site results. Um, so this is output of a database a master student and I created to store um, all of Leo's data uh, and other people's data so it's easily accessible. And you can see all of the poles here from those, uh, well, this is a trim data set of 4,128 matching poles. Um, yeah, so what we see there is the num, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what the trim was there, but for our analysis, we only accepted flows that had more than four specimens a kappa greater than 50. This is this precision parameter. Uh, we did allow AF blanket demagnetization, but we didn't include any NRM data. So this left us with 33 studies um, with 1,389 data. So these are all the, re the results from the past 5 million years, but excluding those from Lunder House. And we can, we can see that we have some offset from the, the, from the pole for the normal data. It's very close for the reverse data. Uh, and when we combine them, they're also close. Um, yes, sorry, I should have mentioned that the red date, the red means that when we're looking at all the VGPs and the blue data are just applying a very crude VGP cutoff at 45 degrees degrees latitude, which may or may not be the right approach to take here. And we can see that the red pole is very biased because of these transitional directions here, which come from one study or a group of studies looking at the R3N3 reversal uh, around about 2 million years ago. So, one thing to consider is that the field may vary more in direction at different times in Earth history. Um, and this may be related to changes in the geodynamo and also might be related to deep Earth conditions in the mantle. Uh, Leo Christensen noted that for Icelandic lavas, directional variability appeared to increase with age. And there have also been efforts to compile all lava data globally and ass assess declar directional vari variability um, with age and with the latitude of the site. For example, the PSV10 compilation of Cromwell et al. 2018. Um, so I'm gonna be showing a parameter here called VGP dispersion. This is just a measure of how variable the VGPs are. So if you look at one of these plots, they will have some degree of dispersion. And the, the thought is that maybe the dispersion uh, varies with the site latitude. So this is the 0 to 5 million data set for PSV10 from Cromwell et al. 2018. Um, in this, in my analysis of this, I actually used a slightly different cutoff. Um, and I'm sure uh, Andy Biggin can give you a much better explanation of this than me, but it's an iterative cutoff process. Um, in the study, all reverse data were treated as normal data as well. So broadly, you can see that there is some sort of trend going through this data set. In the Cromwell study, he had very strict criteria for the data that were accepted. So for Iceland, up here, well, this is a combination of Iceland and Alaska, only 110 lower flows were accepted. Um, so various models have been proposed to fit this uh, 
distribution with latitude. Uh, and one that's used commonly is this something called Model G by Mac McFadden et al. in 1988. And uh, these fits were kindly done by Richard Bono for me. Um, and we can see that calculated 95% bootstrap confidence limits on here. Um, and this model seems to fit reasonably well the data at higher latitudes uh, seems to be a bit off. So what I want to do now is to compare our Lunderhouse sections in different ways, either north and not either normal or reverse polarity or through the different crons and see how they compare with the data set as a whole and to this model. Okay. And on here, I'm, mask, I'm marking the dispersion for Iceland, which is about 19 degrees. Um, and this is a combination of uh, sorry, Alaska and Iceland data. Okay, so if we look at all the Lunderhaus data, um, it, the VGP dispersion is much higher uh, than we would expect for this Model G trend. Now, why is this? Well, let's break this down. Okay. Oh, and if we compare it to all the ice PMAC data that met the criteria, yeah, it's much higher than this as well. And the, all the Iceland data is much closer to, to the model here. If we look at the normal data, this the dispersion is less. If we look at the reverse data, the dispersion is really very high. So this is a, quite an interesting observation. Perhaps it suggests there's some some difference between reversed and normal fields during this time. But maybe this isn't quite the way we should be looking at it. Um, because when we look at the ice PMAG normal or reverse data, we see that they're very, they're very similar. So perhaps there's some difference between the crons themselves in the directional variability. Maybe crons of different ages have a differing de degree of variability. And I think that that's what we're seeing here. If we look at the upper Gilbert crawl, so that was that really big stack of reverse directions, we can see that they have a much greater directional variability than the lower Gauss uh, normal uh, directions here, which li lie very close to uh, the, the model here. And if, and if we do include all of the results together, we do get a very similar result to the model. So my suggestion, my idea is that once the field reverses and it goes into a new cron, it, the field can either be in a new state where it can be more variable or depending on if it's normal or reverse, maybe there is a persistent um, non-dipolar field or maybe another field uh, that is influencing the field at the Earth's surface, which is maybe more, more visible during the reversed cron itself. Okay, and if I just, if we update the, the model uh, we see there's very li little difference, but we do see that there's a very low scatter in the dispersion estimate and it, it, it's very close to this model estimate. Okay, summary. Uh, well, we obtained well constrained directions from most of the lavas. Um, around 150 lavas provided directions in total. That's from Lunderhaus and England's house. We obtained new argon dating and we combine these with pilot potassium ages, uh, which, su which suggests that we record field variations from C3N.1R, so this is just before the Kochiti subcron, about 4.3 million years, to the Gauss-Matiyama boundary, about 2.6 million years. And this is the most detailed recording of the paleomagnetic field by any composite section of lavas over this time. But there's so still some ambiguities uh, with their magnetostratigraphy and some further dating would be useful to reconcile these. Uh, the normal and reverse directions from Lunderhaus tend to a geocentric axial dipole field. Um, 
and this on the whole agrees with the 0 to 5 million year fission mean direction direction calculated from all other Icelandic sites matching the criteria that we used. Um, the Lunda house data are consistent with the fission distribution over this time, uh, but only when the transitional data are removed. Um, a combination of published Icelandic data and our new Lunda house data allows for a more precise estimate of EGP dispersion at higher latitudes. And you could see that this we require many thousands of lavas to get such precision, which would suggest that if you're going to calculate precision estimates, then if I just back up here for a sec, that numbers such as 76, 31, 32 are not enough to determine a good estimate of SB plus you need to have these over a long time over many crons to start to average average out these individual variations of the cron. Perhaps some of these variations here are related to data that come from one cron. Um, that's something that I'm going to look into in the future. Okay, um, so yes, my one of my take homes here is that VGP distortion may vary from cron to cron, and this may relate to um, how the ge geodynamo is varying through time. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm open to uh, any questions you may have. Thanks. We have some virtual claps, but I'll give you a okay. give me a clap as well. Oh, thank you. Um, so there's, there's a clapping. So um, questions for Max, and I'll let Andy go first, because I know he has to rush off, I think. So uh, does Andy have anything that he wants to? Thanks very much. Um, yes, I do. Well, first of all, thank you for a really great talk, Max. That was, that's such a nice data set and uh, really, really uh, clearly presented as well. Um, so, yeah, a, a quick comment and, um, and a question. Uh, so my comment is just that I think the behavior you're seeing there, I think we could probably find that well supported in, in Dynamo simulations and that, you know, the, the shorter crons um, tend to show more variable field behavior. Uh, and I think you'd see that in the, um, in, in the, in the BGP scatter. Um, and well, cause and effect is difficult to talk about, but an associated um, feature of those short cons is that they tend to be weak as well with a, yes. a lower axial um, uh, dipole dominance That's as right. well. So I think, it, you know, it, it all ties together really quite nicely for me, actually. And, you know, I'd be interested to, to look at that together, actually. Um, and then, nice yeah. Idea. Yeah, my, my question is um, just, yeah, relates to just a technical aspect, which is you said about this variable tilting. So I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm interested in how big this tilting was. I suspect it was rather small, um, but also how, how could you um, be sure that it wasn't um, primary tilt, you know, that, that, that it was tectonic? Yeah, so the uh, tilting can, does vary from the bottom to the top because of uh, the loading of the sections. Uh, in, in, in general, it it's, can be reasonably consistent on thicker lava sections, as you might get at East Iceland, this can be much more of an issue. Uh, but in West Iceland, the, it wasn't, it's not that thick, but you can see that as in that photo I was showing, that's about seven degrees, but in some section, it does appear to be maybe up to 15 degrees of tilt there. Determining, my, it's, most likely that they are erupted uh, flat and it's through time that they've started to bend as you've got more loading on the cent on the central aspect yeah. here so that's in the central area and of course that there's um, this this loads the whole of the crust and then it was then you have ice on the top uh, this loads it more the ice is removed and you get the rebound as well um, in there. Uh, Okay, yeah, all right, so you have a model for that. All right, well, um, thanks again, Max. Uh, yeah, I've got to shoot yeah. off and do a, a careers well, fair at a local school. Just just one sec, Andy. So we are we are looking at the intensity as well. So oh, that's fantastic. one thing that we're doing. We're, we're trying to make a relative paleo intensity and then try and calibrate that from lavas that show 
the most uh, suitable behavior, suitable behavior for paleo, for absolute paleo intensity. So we're, we're, that's one of our next steps is to do that. Yeah. Very okay. Cool. Thanks for your questions, there. Andy. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Max. Bye. So, um, Caitlin, just to check, there hasn't been anything appearing on chats that I am too incompetent to work out if there's anything there. No, there's nothing from YouTube yet. Okay, so don't worry about there not being enough questions because I could keep going for hours, but I won't. So, it's yeah. Okay. Your questions are always good, Richard. Um, uh, we'll see. Yale, you're, you seem to be, I presume that's a, a question rather than an extra kind of one handed applause. So, Yale. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, nice talk, Max. Um, I might have missed it, but I was wondering if you checked the BTP dispersion for PSV10, where the sites are either normal or reverse, if that makes a difference as well, just like in your Iceland data. Oh, I've not made separate plots for the normal and the reverse there. Yeah. I'm not really sure how that will fall out because of the low number of data for many of the sites, no. um, but it would it would be interesting to see if overall there are differences in the in the, in the trend if we yeah. look at reversed and normal. Um, I mean, from a theoretical point, I guess Richard could chime in. There should be no real difference between a reversed and a normal field, unless there would maybe be some kind of forcing that creates a persistent field structure through time that would uh, influence normal re and reversed, but... Yeah. To use an excellent German word, yain, that's yes or no. Um, <laughs> no, yeah. But, but I think uh, Yael shows, has shown recently very effectively that there isn't any obvious departure between the two of them. Um, uh, I mean, in the time average field models, but obviously. Yeah. Which does bring me, bring me wonderfully, thank you, Yael, to my question, which is time average. For, so you're arguing very strongly for GAD, and that's very reasonable. But if you well, I'm not at, saying strongly, I'm just saying that's the data it's, it's consistent. seems to agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Max, sorry. I, I, my apologies <laughs> for making you take a strong position there. Um, but the thing I was wondering about for the time average field models, and I'm thinking both the, the recent one, but also actually Yael's um, model of the Miocene, what do those models suggest for... Um, the um, departure from GAD for Iceland, and therefore, is this support for? I mean, I would have thought that they would be consistent with your data because there's such a um, large collection. He says in a polite way of um, Icelandic data to go into these models. Yeah. But is it so? The thing about it, you know, is it, there's questions about how good is GAD? Is Iceland yeah. well suited to test that? Well, well positioned. Or put another way, what do you get for a um, departure from GAD from the time average models for Iceland? Are you who are you asking this? <laughs> something that recently graduated PhD students maybe should could could do for us. That would be yes, lovely. I mean, I'm looking yeah. at my own models really quickly, but obviously this is a completely different time. Yeah. So the only thing I've looked yeah, the only thing I've looked at is that collection of 1,400 ish data. Mm. Um, and they seem kind of close, but there's the question, how do you treat the transitional data there? Because there's, there's a lot of transitional data from Iceland and sure. Well, how do we treat that tail in the distribution there? Okay. So maybe a question for us to talk about, um, yeah. uh, after this. Yeah. I mean, when I did, uh, yes, we can talk about that and I can talk about Fisher distributions too with you. Yeah. Um, okay, the first sounds exciting, the second sounds <laughs> less kind of wildly attractive, but we'll see. Well, I mean, it, yeah, okay. Anyway, I should shut up. Who else has a question? Anyone? Yeah, well, did you have other questions? No, okay. I've got a question I can jump in. Um, Go ahead, Mary. So you had some transitions where you had quite a lot of transitional as you just said, quite a lot of transitional measurements. And then others where it just seemed to go straight from normal to reversed. Yes. Is this primarily due to the fact that you've got different lavas? So 
you know, you'll have a gap in time between subsequent barbers or between reversals taking different lengths of time or both. It could be both, yes. Um, there's definitely going to be breaks in volcanism throughout the section. Um, so it's quite common to have just reverse and normal. So there could be meant there could be yeah a block of lavas that we've we've missed, or yeah it could be a very rapid reversal. Um, on average, each of these lavas might come out around about one every ten thousand years. Sometimes a bit quicker, sometimes a, a bit uh, more frequent, one times a little less frequent. The reversal duration itself could vary from you know uh, maybe less than a thousand years to many thousand years, depending um, on the state of the field at that time, but also on your location, the directional variability across the earth uh, or the duration of the reversals isn't, I don't think it's going to be the same across earth. It might be latitudinally dependent, or it may be dependent on non-dipolar structures that are variable across the earth. Max um, is being very, uh, um, uh, modest here, I can recommend an excellent paper, Brown, Holman, Bargery, to discuss that issue. <laughs> yeah, and also we've seen it in uh, models of excursions where we took the most recent excursion, we took lots of data series and we modelled that, Richard's on that work, uh, where we saw that the field was very non-uniform during these transitional times uh, and you have differing lengths of directional variability depending where you are on the Earth as well. We're always searching for like these little indications in our sections. You know, is this a flow top? Is, this, is, there, is there a little lens here or a lens there? You know, when we know that we've got these, might have these reversal boundaries, but sometimes we're just going to miss, miss them or the field change quickly. Yeah. But in Iceland, the lava production rate does vary depending on the glaciation. So when you've got a lot of glaciation, which we had here uh, around about in those older ones where it just flip, flips, this is suppresses uh, the volcanism. But as the ice starts to melt, this uh, induces a greater de degree of volcanism and you start to have more lavas coming out more rapidly in time. So maybe as we're going, coming out of the last, uh, or coming out of the glacial period there, that we do have more effusive volcanism um, producing more frequent lavas, and that's maybe part of the reason we're getting more details as we're going up up through the lava section there. Okay, I'm going to have to cut Max off briefly because Mimi is sitting there very patiently. So, Mimi. Hi, I was just um, wondering, Max, if you compared to um, the Hawaii data, seeing it's uh, similar time intervals, I yes. remember that that's right. mammoths and things. Yeah, there's the, the lower mammoth, and there's some other Hawaii studies, a couple of other ones. And I, I've looked into that briefly, but I've not made um, a detailed analysis of that. But I know you worked on the intensity through the lower, the lower mammoth. Yeah, low, lower and upper mammoth and the yeah. Gilbert Gales. Yeah, because yeah. there are, I mean, I don't think it's as many lava flows, but I meant there are the yeah, some nice transitional ones as well. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. No, that would definitely be a next step to to look at the Hawaii data, see how that compares, look at maybe the variability through those crumbs that we have there as well. Um, I mean, it could be that the the site for you know a particular location on Earth might have more variability as well. Uh, not just that it varies with latitude; it could be just related to where you are on Earth that creates a different degree of variability too. Do you have the original data, maybe? Oh, I do probably. <laughs> yeah, I think I do actually have all the original, maybe even raw data. I'm, I'm not sure I'd have to yeah. look, but yeah. yeah. I mean, that could be very well. nice to, 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 to look through a little bit and make a comparison. We've still got samples as well, probably in the lab. Oh, how, <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now something has appeared on the chat. What appeared on the chat? Oh, someone someone being polite. We passed swiftly on from that. Um, so any other questions for Max? 
I've got one very specific question, but I think it'll be very boring for people, so I'll ask Max afterwards. I have a really quick question. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> I um, looked into all the data from Iceland, as mentioned before, and I found a lot of papers from Iceland, uh, from Leo Christian, yes, that's as you right. mentioned. Uh, but a lot of them actually didn't demagnetize properly stepwise. I think they weren't yeah. what? A lot of the data wasn't like demagnetized properly, like stepwise using uh, principal component analysis. So uh, running for the they were demagnetized properly. You just didn't use principal component analysis. So I feel like some of them I even excluded. They're all going, they're all going to be demagnetized. So in Leo's approach, he would start at the NRM and he would demagnetize down until mm -hmm. he found that di direction was no longer changing. And okay. when you have a data set such as Iceland, such as the uh, results I was showing, that, that first plot where it's just a single component that goes to mm -hmm. the origin, that is it. the majority of Iceland data are like that. So it is a reasonable approach, in my opinion, to do that. You do not need principal component analysis to tell you that you have a good, a stable direction when you have a single component that goes to the origin. So my to, 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 my, to my, my respond, and Andy's gone away, so I can say this without being shouted at, but um, these kind of criteria and what's appropriate or not are potentially very useful. But if Leo is an author, I don't think you need to worry too much. Um, he didn't do bad measure, bad approaches on this. I might need to look again yeah. on what I mean, exactly you wrote, because this... I remember I excluded a lot of his papers from the... My yes, papers. I know, and Jeff did as well. Yeah. yeah, but that's a criteria. Yeah. And it's based upon a criteria, and you've always got to look what why a criteria is being used. Look at what kind of data you're 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 looking into, and the and what you know. We have this problem with the Holocene models, don't we, Richard? Where people get rid of data. Yes. But we always want to start, in my opinion, with the most data we have. We don't want to just start with a criteria and go, okay, we're cutting out a thousand data, right? We want to be looking at that data. We want to see, well, what does that data show? Okay, what trends are there? How are we going to look into those trends more? Why and why might we be skeptical of certain things or not? That would be my approach. Well, it's not um, Greg, Greg is agreeing. Um, Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. It's just in my thesis so far, so I can have another look. No, I, th I yeah. think it, it would be, um, I mean, Leo's data would provide an excellent case study of that. And as I say, we, we do that because there's some random data that have all sorts of bad treatments on it. But I think yeah. we should not be afraid of looking at data where we really expect it to be good. And both in terms of the sampling and the availability and in the person, I think those are going to be good. Now, I'll have a look. <laughs> yeah. And the, the results between the samples also agree very well. You know, he has very high K values, very low alpha 95s for the flows. And that's another indication that even though he didn't do PCA or have an MAD or whatever, that the results are very consistent. Yeah. But yeah, I know. It's just a whole, uh, a whole uh, debate for sure. Yeah. I think, I think we're, we're converging on, on the debate, but it's just that, you know, <laughs> this is excellent. You, you know, things like this, but moderation and all things, even this kind of stuff and that when there are reasons to believe that things are okay they should at least be looked at yeah um, yeah it's just uh, apparently we need like to actually talk to each other to find out because obviously <laughs> i have no idea about oh, yeah. who yeah. this leo christiansen yeah. is so I, yeah. <laughs> wow you survived that, that years wow very very impressive <laughs> very young richard well you know he measured over five five thousand lavas in his oh yeah i've seen his name <laughs> yeah <laughs> So that's a lot of samples you mentioned. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much okay. for inviting me, Caitlin. It was a pleasure to give this talk to you all, and I hope all is well in Liverpool at the moment. Well, Mimi's still got a hand up. Is that a residual oh. hand, or is that a new hand? It's not a new hand. I didn't know I had to take it off. Sorry. All right. But what, nonetheless, hello. Wave, wave back at you, Mimi. Yeah, thanks, Max, for a really interesting talk. I really enjoyed it and I'm not too familiar with the field, but it was explained really well. So thank you. 
Uh, next week, just to tell, let everyone know, we, we have a talk from Yael, uh, which will be in person, but also streamed online if you want to watch virtually. So, Caitlin, can you leave us connected for? Yeah, yes, I will if, end the. If Max session has a little, now. Max has a little bit of uh, time.